everybody. Uh, welcome to another episode of the RJ series webinars. Um, as you can see in your cameras, I am with Martin Wright, with Dr. Martin Wright. It's an absolute pleasure to have Martin as part of this um, series. Um, I couldn't think of a better person to interview for um, for the restorative justice. And so many people said to me, Theo, you've got to speak to people who have been doing this for so many years. Um, and we want to hear from, from, from these practitioners. And, and Martin has been one of the people that inspired me actually to start reading and writing and uh, practicing restorative justice uh, 21 years ago. Um, and I met Martin when I first started my PhD and he was one of the very kind people who introduced me to the concept and one of my first interviewees when I was um, trying to understand and indeed define restorative justice. And as part of my doctoral thesis, I was asking different practitioners what they understood uh, as restorative justice and we stayed in touch for 21 years. And Martin sometimes advised me on different topics that I was trying to cover whether it was punishment or different different topics that I was writing about um, and now is the time I think to share some of the things that you said to me Martin about restorative justice um, and we'll keep it very simple um, um, first off obviously I'll ask you to introduce yourself though I'm sure people who are watching these already know about your amazing work and the books that you have published um, and the work that you have done not just in the UK but as an international I think restorative justice figure, especially in, in Europe. Um, and, and I want to kind of hear your own, um, not definition, but your own understanding of what this pink elephant, and I just call, call it, what this restorative justice is about. What is it? Um, and then just literally just tell us about um, what, what is the history of restorative justice? How did you experience it in the many years that you have been? practicing and rights and restorative justice. What are you experiencing today um, in, in, in the UK and, and in Europe, if you can? And then what do you think is the future for the restorative justice? Well, thank you, Theo, for those kind words. Um, I thought when we start defining restorative justice, perhaps the best way to begin would be with a case history, although all cases are obviously different. But one which I came across was a case of robbery, which was rather unpleasant because a young man hit himself in a female toilet. And then when a woman came in, he grabbed her purse and, and her money uh, and he was duly caught and uh, he was sentenced to four and a half years in prison. And she wanted to know more about him, the background to his offence and why he had done this to her. And uh, he agreed to meet her. And they had an emotional meeting with uh, lots of explanations and tears and so on. And she understood a bit more about why he had done it and how he was feeding his drug habit and all that. And it ended up with uh, her feeling much more understanding. And she and her partner even gave him a lift home after the session. And that is the way restorative justice can work. Obviously, it's not always as simple as that, but that's the, the general picture of it. One of the factors is consent. It's got to be done with the agreement of both the offender and the victim. And that means that it's never going to be a cure-all because um, they won't always agree. But at least it's there, it's a possibility, and it ought to be available. So that's uh, an example in, in real life. Um, to put it into more formal words, it's been described as a process by which everyone harmed by or involved in a crime or an, another form of injustice can discuss how they've been affected and what should be done to repair the harm. And that, that's the, the essence of what it's all about. Yeah, can I um, ask you a little bit more about uh, this word harm? Because when I hear harm and um, it, it, my, my mind doesn't automatically go to what we call now crime, which mm. obviously for, for when you say crime, you also mean uh, legislation. You also mean 
you know, criminal justice courts and all these sort of other kind of more criminal justice structural stuff. But when we say harm, that can be harm, I don't know, between a parent and a child, I suppose, or family members or, or partners. It does restorative justice, in your view, have a place for this for these types of harm that are not necessarily crimes and within the criminal justice system? Yes, it does. And there is a bit of confusion about this, partly because of the word justice, because it makes people think of courts and all that. Uh, and so many people prefer to use the word restorative practice. And that means a similar process in which the essence of it is that the people get together with a facilitator to keep things on an even keel and um, they, they sort things out between themselves. And in fact, one of the things it can do is to get things out of the criminal justice system. Some things which uh, could be treated as a crime, like antisocial behaviour, don't have to be. And they can be quite satisfactorily dealt with uh, in other ways, such as restorative practice. Yes. And, and you have written about, you know, the kind of more the maximalistic kind of approach uh, when it comes to understanding restorative justice and think about it probably in schools, in educational settings as well. The preventative side of, of restorative justice, which is not just about what happens after the harm has taken place. And, and I can see, in fact, you know, through my own projects that, you know, probably the majority of restorative justice happen at the preventative stage. Yes, certainly it can. And that particularly applies in cases where the the two parties, um, we call them for shorthand, we call them victim and offender, but the the complainant and the, uh, the har harmer, which is a rather awkward word, um, <laughs> If they know each other, then um, it becomes even more relevant and it may me mean that it restores a relationship which existed in the past. It's broken and you can put it back together again. Yeah, thank you for that. I think I think that um, I think it's a very clear kind of outline of restorative justice with the, with a case as well. Um, you know, I, I, I forgive me, forgive me for this, but I do think you are a legend, you know, when it comes to restorative justice. And as I said, you know, you're one of the first people in the 70s who who actually got involved in restorative justice. And I just want you to share with us those early days, um, because you are one of the few people, at least in the UK, who have experienced those set in the 70s and in the 80s. You know, the articles that you wrote um, alongside Nils Christie's work and how Zer's work. Just talk us a little bit about, about you know, how it developed in, in the UK. How, how, you know, how did it come about? Um, when did you hear for the first time restorative justice and what got you interested in exploring it? Well, first of all, I, I was only one of the people involved. Um, the way it affected me particularly was that in the 70s, I was working for the Howard League for Penal Reform, which campaigns for the reform of criminal justice and prisons in particular. And I heard of an experiment in a place called Kitchener in Ontario, Canada, um, where a, a young couple of young men had gone on the rampage and they'd done a lot of criminal damage. And the probation officer, who is responsible for the case, thought, wouldn't it make more sense instead of just punishing them and then it's over and done with and maybe they'll go ahead and do it again, if they actually remembered the people they'd done it to, the victims uh, whose uh, car mirrors they'd smashed, whose windows they'd broken, whatever they'd done, and for them actually to, to meet face to face. And he put this to, the, to his senior and to the judge and rather to his surprise, it was agreed. The judge said, go ahead. And so this young probation officer with no training or experience took the two young men and 22 victims agreed to meet him. And he worked out um, how he could make reparation, either by um, paying some money or by doing some community service, etc. And they took this package back to the judge. And the judge said, all right, that is the sentence. And they, they did what they said they would do. And um, it 
uh, was so successful that they made it into a project which was called the Victim Offender Reconciliation Programme. And uh, in 1974, word about this came to this country. And um, along with other people, I thought it was interesting and ought to be explored. And now, so what you were working uh, at Howlig and, and you saw this, it was interesting. What happened after that? Did you actually get to do it in practice? Did, did you implement it here in the UK? Um, you started writing about it. What, what happened after that? It was implemented in a few places in the UK, um, but it never really took off at this stage. Um, mm. My own involvement, I, I wanted to actually do it as opposed to just theorising about it, um, but there were no opportunities at that time where I lived. Um, what there was, was um, a community mediation programme, which is the, the next best thing. And so in, in Lambeth, where I lived, the Lambeth Mediation Service was formed and I, I was one of its members. And so that, that was my first practical experience. A bit later on, I did have some actual cases involving crimes. Um, but th that was how it began. And, and now moving on kind of from the 70s and the 80s and, uh, you know, the, the, the restorative justice then, uh, how do you kind of see restorative justice now in the UK and in Europe? Do you think it progressed into um, a, an actual and viable option for, for, for people who are involved or have been harmed? Uh, involved in the criminal justice system or, you know, as we said before, in kind of educational settings and schools. But what's your view on the current development of restorative justice here in the UK and in, and in Europe even? It certainly is a viable option. It, in this country, it's, I think the, the word which has been used is patchy, that it depends where you live, whether there's uh, somebody in the system who is enthusiastic about it and makes it happen. And where it does, it, it can be very successful. It is funded by police and crime commissioners out of their budgets. And if that person supports it, then, then it's likely to happen in their area. Uh, so it's uh, what I would like it to, to I, I would like there to be infrastructure so that it was available everywhere, because mm. it's no use saying, every victim and every offender, offender should have the option of taking part in restorative justice if the infrastructure isn't there to make it happen. Yes. And do you think, I mean, compared to Europe, because, you know, in, at the European level, obviously we had some very good developments, I would say, in terms of um, trying to mainstream or introduce restorative justice. There is a, you know, the Victims Directive, for example, mentions restorative justice explicitly. Uh, and particularly around capacity building and training of practitioners and safeguards. Uh, we have the recommendations of the Council of Europe as well um, in relation to restorative justice. The United Nations also did a lot of work on restorative justice. Do you think that now in the UK, um, compared to what is happening in Europe and you know, international with restorative justice, we are we are taking a step forward. Are we are we kind of leading the way, do you think, or are we taking a step back? Uh, I think we are going slowly forward. Uh, we haven't gone as far or as fast as some countries. For example, some of them have legislation uh, in Norway, which is one one of the places where it began. Uh, they have a a, a special. Um, victims board which uh, pr provides for it to happen and incidentally it provides for volunteers to be the facilitators uh, to really involve the community in the process. Um, in Finland it comes not under the criminal justice system but under social welfare. Mm. Um, Austria, it is done by the probation service and so on. It's different in different places. And of course, we mustn't forget outside Europe. Um, one of the leading places was New Zealand with its family group conferencing, which brings together the, the family of the offender as well as the actual offender and the victim. And they, they work out the, the best way forward for, for that particular case. And that's something which we haven't picked up as much as we might, although it, it has been done on a small scale in this country. Yes. 
And um, just now I want to challenge you a little bit about, um, you know, when, when people see your name, obviously they'll think, oh, he's an advocate of restorative justice, you know, Theo probably kind of in the middle, you know, but they're still kind of, they're, they're, you know, they sign up to, the, to, this, to this concept and to this idea. But I want to ask you, have you, you know, in your years of practice and also writing and researching restorative justice, have you ever had any concerns about restorative justice? How is implemented? How is understood? You know, concerns especially around, you know, the victim or, you know, even the offender. Um, have you actually been in a kind of situation where you were seeing it being implemented and said, oh, well, actually, that that is not good? Um, I haven't been involved in cases like that, but I, I've heard about them and read about them. Uh, there have been cases where the, the person who facilitates the meeting between the victim and the offender uh, doesn't do it very well, possibly hasn't been trained. Uh, the importance of preparing both sides hasn't always been stressed enough because they need to know what they're letting themselves in for. Uh, so, yes, it, it can, like anything else of this kind, it can be done well or badly. But mm -hmm. the important thing is that it, it should be done well. And that's why I would like there to be not, not a bureaucracy, but at least some more structure to, mm -hmm. to make sure that standards are maintained and that it's available throughout the country. Yeah, and, and I have to uh, be honest with you, and it's, this is kind of an issue that I struggled with um, uh, with my own research, because like you, uh, for example, I believe in the in the potential, but also the the power of uh, the community led version of restorative justice and not so much the kind of the structure and top down hierarchical version of restorative justice, which can be uh, through the criminal justice system. And I've seen fantastic examples of community-led uh, practices, whether it was here in London or, you know, some experience I have in Canada, obviously Aboriginal practices, all those kind of community-led and community-born, you know, um, uh, practices. Uh, and, and how do you, you know, you just said about standards and about safeguards and about mm. you know, some sort of structure, but how do you, um, how do you have, like, find the balance between ensuring that the community-led and community-born nature of restorative justice and the fact that it is organic and it is a reaction of the community um, and at the same time have this structured and standard standards that we need to follow and make sure that everything is done properly we're not opening up you know wounds or re-victimizing people how do you think that we can reach this balance can we ever reach this balance well, I think it has to be done by uh, by training and supervision, by self-evaluation. For example, in Lambeth Community Mediation, we always work in pairs. And the, the idea is that after any session, we evaluate each other and we are trained to, to give feedback in a positive, constructive way. Uh, whether we always live up to that, I, I don't know, but uh, it, it is the, the the principle of the thing is there. There is a problem in, in the other direction, and that is that if it's done by professionals, such as police or probation officers, then maybe their professional training in, in, in those professions may um, outweigh the, the restorative side of things, and they, they may tend to be directive and judgmental and all those things which facilitators ought not to be. And mm. so um, either way, it's, it's got to be done differently. One, one way is the way it's done in Austria, which is that it's given to the probation service, so it is official, um, but the probation officers who do it uh, are exclusively working on restorative practices. And so um, they, they put their probation training on one side and they are restorative justice facilitators. And mm. that's... Uh, but possibly has the best of both worlds. They they have the uh, the supervision and the standards, um, but they don't have the influence of some um, criminal justice attitudes in the back of their minds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, I think one of the issues that you know we have identified in the past, of course, you mentioned so many examples from around the world. Is how do we uh, learn and you know from each other. 
because there are a lot of, of, of good examples out there and how do we connect, you know, through a network of, of practice or of research uh, of policy and I think there's a long way to go before we say, yeah, we are talking to each other now and we know what we're doing, what works best. Um, I think that now kind of takes us to the final kind of um, my final question, which is about the future. Um, and, you know, I just want to get your view on what you think, you know, the next few years are looking for sort of justice. I think going back to where we began, um, restorative justice can extend into restorative practices in other fields as well as criminal justice, in other forms of conflict resolution, in the workplace, and particularly in schools. I'd like it to begin in schools so that children learn from the beginning that the, the way to resolve conflicts is by mediation and by negotiation and not by who is the stronger. And uh, so that's, that's the direction I would like to see it going. Uh, a number of things are can be decriminalized that it may be that things which at the moment uh, there ought to be a law against it well not necessarily it may be that it, it should be negotiated away and uh, that's the, the the direction of travel what one idea that uh, is increasingly talked about, which I like very much, and it's beginning to happen, is the idea of the restorative city. And that is a, an, an area, a city or a borough or a town. And what? how would you know that you were living in a restorative city? It would be because anybody who has dealings with people, whether they're housing officers or social workers or police or whatever, teachers especially, that they would have had training in restorative practices and mm -hmm. that they, they would conduct their interactions with the people they work with in a restorative way. And it would involve in, involve people. It would not, not be top down. It would be people working it out for themselves. Yeah. I'm so happy you said that. I, I think I mentioned to you briefly last time I saw you, um, uh, at the event that, that, that we met, um, that I am now, I've got this new vision here in SE16 London to create the first uh, London restorative postcode, where all the service providers, um, whether it's private organisations, Southern Council, uh, public sector organisations, voluntary organisations, behave in a restorative justice way. Mm. Um, and I was given the opportunity to, um, to run a community centre which we started, we opened the doors last year. And now from that community center, we provide a holistic service from food banks, community fridges, health and fitness classes, um, also cultural workshops, um, youth clubs, uh, but also restorative justice after the harm has taken place or interventions. And I'm, I'm having conversations with the council and different private organizations to create you know, a steering group where, as you said, we can all kind of learn, but also get teaching and training on restorative justice to see if we can make a difference, at least in the SC16 area, um, and see over a period of time, over a few years, whether antisocial behavior will come down, whether criminal justice, the criminal justice system and the local police is not as involved in disputes, um, the estates around us, because the five estates around us have all sorts of from domestic violence to hate incidents taking place and see if anything changes. So that that's something that I am piloting, you know, in my own neighborhood, which is where I live as well. Um, and yeah, I want to I want to see how it goes. But as you said, it, it's, it's, it's about everybody being on the same page, I think. And um, and, and hopefully this webinar will help to break down you know sometimes what it does appear to be a complex concept which i don't think it is restorative justice is a straightforward concept but as you said um, the word justice sometimes might just confuse things mm. or you know we, we we tend to think in a certain way which is why you know i love uh, how's uh, approach with the changing lenses and you know removing those lenses that we have been using for so long uh, to view crime and see harm through other 
different lenses, which is probably the restorative justice lenses. I think one thing that I would like to get from you as well is, you know, with new researchers and junior junior new researchers or newcomers to restorative justice, students out there who, who come across the concept, what advice would you give them um, if they want, let's say, to, to practice or to write or to do a PhD or to research restorative justice? What advice would you give them having been in this field for, for so long? Um, I would like them to, if, if possible, to, to do it themselves, and not, not just to theorize about it. Uh, I would like them to think partly about the, the, the words used. Some of the words which we use in this field are words like punishment and deterrence and so on. And I wish we could think instead of, shall we say, the consequences which do not necessarily have to be painful consequences. They can be making demands of people, getting them to do community service or uh, undergoing therapy or whatever. P punishment changed to consequences, deterrence changed to prevention. And so generally to, to, to start again with their thinking on how we are trying to uh, influence the way people behave to each other. Thank you. No, that was that's that's really good advice. And, you know, just uh, I think you're absolutely right. You can write and read about restorative justice, but if you don't get to actually do it and experience it, you know, in a, whether it's mediation or sequencing, whatever it is, circles, then I think you, you will miss you know, what it's actually all about and just feel it yourself. And that's when I understood, really understood restorative justice, when I was able to connect uh, with the other person uh, while it was taking place. Um, I just want to say a huge thank you for for uh, for doing this. Um, is there anything else that you'd like to add um, that you want to share? Well, there is one question which no doubt you've come across with your project, which is how it's to be paid for. And okay. I'd like there to be some method by which we can say that prevention is better than cure and it actually saves money. And I'd like some sort of mechanism by which the money saved uh, is actually transferred to the preventative efforts. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know how that can be done, but I, I hope that you can persuade your local council and other people can do likewise. Yeah, and, and as you know, you know, funding, I mean, at some point here in the UK, as funding was, was quite generous for restorative justice. There were big grants that, you know, were given to specific organisations to capacity build, uh, criminal justice professionals, um, and also to deliver practices. In fact, I was involved in the restorative justice service here in London that the mayor uh, ran for three years. Restore London was called, and I evaluated that practice. And now, as you know, that kind of funding died out um, and is very small and through uh, the uh, police and crime commissioners, uh, very localized. Um, but that doesn't mean that there are other ways um, to get funding for, for restorative justice, especially for prevention. So just to share my, my experience, for example, we have managed to set up the community centre to provide all these services, which are part of this holistic preventative, I mm. think, um, uh, approach, but not necessarily saying that we want funding for restorative justice. We, we you know, we focus, let's say, the, the council has a health grant so we would apply for the health brand to provide health related services and as part of that would be counseling would be mental health and you know we talked about this so many times preparing parties before they come into the mediation around you know the psychological uh needs that they might have especially if there's a crime like domestic violence which mm -hmm. might not be a crime per se. so so getting uh, being creative about your fundraising and being kind of more open-minded um then that helps, I think, um, to 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 get the funds for preventative work. That's my 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 advice. Try and be creative because there is support out there when you make the case uh, for it and connect the dots. I think. Um, and the other thing is also, you know, you'd be surprised because communities, when they see the value of um, these non-formal ways of 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 delivering justice. They do support it and like people like you would volunteer, uh, which means no costs, 
or even sometimes donate. And we did have, you know, private donors or, you know, philanthropists who would see the value. Obviously, it's how clear you make the case for restorative justice, how well you articulate the evidence that you have that it works and that it makes a difference to people. Uh, and not blowing it out of proportion, which we have seen as well in the past, mm -hmm. claiming that something takes place when actually it doesn't, and just presenting case studies of success, like the one that you mentioned, mm -hmm. with actual people and actual situations. And I think that as a movement, we have to work on and, and do better. That that's, would be my answer. There's an idea from the 1970s, which might appeal to you from the United States, because they had a lot of uh, work on crime control at that time. And one idea they came up with was called the exemplary project. If you had a new project, as it might be yours, uh, and if you can show that it's well run and it's effective and it's evaluated and all the rest of it, uh, and it, it is worth making an example of, then that project would get extra funding to cover the cost of telling other people about it because mm -hmm. it, it takes up some of your time maybe you have to produce publications or whatever uh, and that that all costs money so if you could, can get the status of an exemplary project then um, you can tell other people about it and that helps to spread the word yeah and watch this space martin because you know as you said um before it is about evidence and i'm very passionate about evidence-based Yes. or evidence-driven practice. So watch this space as we progress with the, um, the restorative postcode SE16 area and uh, hopefully we'll get something to share uh, very soon. Uh, but I just want to say again, thank you very much for, for joining the webinar. Um, and yeah, um, again, thank you for the work that you've been doing. Okay, thank you very much for asking me.